uh, like Nick said, that I do get to work down here in Emory County with uh, some really great uh, melon producers. Um, they have introduced me to lots of melons that that I had never tasted before. Um, so, um, and they they do a great job of uh, supplying the state and I think into Colorado and, and so a few other states as well. Uh, if you're interested uh, in growing your own melons, I, I think it's a crop that definitely can be grown in most parts of the state and, and it's, a, it's a fun one to do. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, pests tonight, not really diseases, but, but pests of melons. Uh, these are most, most of the common ones um, and there are definitely some weird ones too. That seems to be uh, why I get a lot of calls uh, is for the exceptionally uh, strange cases, but uh, these are gonna be some of the more uh, standard things that you might see and encounter and uh, hopefully some ways to, to deal with those as well. All right, so we're gonna just dive right in. Um, if you can't hear me, if I mumble, if, I, if something goes wrong, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll just uh, chat for a little while and then we'll do questions at the end. Okay, so one of the, really one of the veins of every gardener's existence is the aphid. And they're, they're a little bit specific. Um, there is a specific melon aphid. Uh, there also uh, melon crops can get attacked by peach tree aphids as well. But um, the, the melon aphid, um, the one that we see most often on watermelon uh, cantaloupe crops is going to be this one. Um, they're kind of light, light to a dark green sort of mottled. Um, they can get almost um, almost a black color. Um, there's a little bit of variety there in the in the color, but they're a size and, and shape that we're probably pretty familiar with. Uh, aphids, uh, because melons are not, um, are, are going to be dying off in the winter, the aphids would need uh, somewhere to host them through the winter. That's really one of the issues here. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about control of these in a, in a second, but uh, that winter host can be something, uh, sometimes it's a woody plant. There are things like uh, catalpa trees or Rose of Sharon, which are, are beautiful landscape plants. But um, if you're going to be growing mel melon crops, they would be somewhere that they might harbor uh, through the winter. Um, but also a lot of our perennial weeds uh, are, are good shelter for these aphids to help them make it through the winter. So uh, that's, that's something that we're going to uh, going to have to work on is getting rid of those weeds. Um, so damage from aphids, it's uh, really a kind of a sticky residue. Sometimes we call it honeydew. Um, we've probably seen that. Um, and, and then curling leaves. Um, the more and more infested the, the plant gets, those leaves start to curl in on them, themselves and sort of hide those, those aphids and give them a space to, to hide out and keep doing their, uh, their damage. Uh, I said that we were going to talk mostly about uh, pests and not diseases, but one of the big things that, that we have to be concerned about, uh, you know, aphids on their own are, are messy and, and enough of them can kill a, a watermelon plant. But what, uh, what we really have to be concerned about is that they are also a vector for disease and they can uh, be a vector for the watermelon mosaic virus as well, which is something that doesn't really have a cure. There's, there's not much that we can do about that, but remove uh, diseased plants from the from the field if we get into that situation. So we want to make sure that we're keeping keeping those aphids out and hopefully preventing the spread of that disease. All right. So when we we talk about control of of aphids, um, one of the best things, um, something that we should think about the most uh, first is really the cultural control. A lot of these methods are going to be the most useful for us. Um, and like with any any pest, uh, we want to be monitoring for it. We want to be trying to, to check out uh, when, when we're getting uh, infested. We want to know kind of the numbers and how these things are spreading so that we can see if it's, if it's worth our time to be um, doing it, um, taking care of it on a, a field level. Uh, sometimes if it's a very small infestation, it, it might just not be economical for us to do anything. Um, but as those, uh, as we watch and, and see if those numbers increase and they start to be infecting uh, more and more uh, of our crop, then, then we might want to, to do something about it. Um, but 
uh, cultural controls. This is just good good practice for farming, gardening in, in your, your backyards. Um, inspect things as they transplants as you bring them in. So I, I don't think I'm giving away any trade secrets um, from Green River's watermelon industry when I tell you that um, it's kind of half and half. <laughs> Most of, uh, some of the farmers plant things straight from seeds and some of them are starting uh, little transplants, uh, usually in their own greenhouses. Um, but if you're going to be buying plants uh, to, to put into your own garden or your own, um, your own melon crop, uh, melon fields, uh, you want to be inspecting all of those as they come into your uh, in, into your area and make sure that they're not bringing aphids and pests from a greenhouse uh, uh, with them. So um, I noticed, and if you'll see in those this picture here, it looks a little messy, but uh, that's actually just the seed coat on on those leaves there. So don't don't freak out about that one. That's not one that that needs to be inspected out. But. Um, the other thing that we can we can do for for aphids um, and for for several other insects as well is to use row covers. I know Nick's done uh, quite a bit of work on this, um, but row covers um, they they need to be uh, something that we can move around so that they can uh, the plants can be pollinated. Uh, but uh, placing those uh, in the early spring and uh, sort of preventing insects from being able to attack our plants can really give them a, a great uh, chance to get started. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention here, and again, I think this is all going back to really just good horticultural pr practice, um, but really managing the nitrogen input. Um, I, I think that sometimes uh, farmers can can think, and home gardener, <laughs> gardeners as well, that if something's good, um, in moderation, then maybe a lot of it's really good. And, and so with nitrogen, I, I think a lot of us are, are actually over fertilizing quite a bit. And, and that can be a, a downfall to us uh, in, in this instance, because uh, high levels of nitrogen can really allow those uh, aphid colonies to, to go crazy. And it can make those infestations uh, even worse. So we wanna be, managing the nitrogen and making sure that we're applying what the plant needs, but not a lot of extra. And if we can do that in smaller increments, um, you know, if it's a slow release form of nitrogen, or if it's something that we're applying uh, smaller uh, applications uh, multiple times through the season rather than one big one, um, that can, can really help with this situation as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, again, uh, you know, just Good, good gardening practice. Uh, we want to be removing weeds. Uh, you know, if we leave things around the edge of the field, if we leave a lot of weeds in other parts of our yard or or neighboring fields. Uh, those are places where uh, the aphids can can winter over and come back even stronger and in bigger numbers the next year. So we want to make sure that we're removing weeds. Um, chemical control. This is. Not, not always the easiest one to do with aphids. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of species that have really developed uh, resistance to insecticides. And so it's gonna be hard to, to knock out all of the aphids using uh, just a chemical, con chemical control. Uh, also, um, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, I mentioned, you know, as things get more and more infested, um, you'll see those leaves curling in on each other. And, and it's a place for those aphids to hide where they would not necessarily um, get hit with the, the chemical that you might be spraying. So, uh, you know, trying to prevent them um, before we have to reach that chemical option is, is usually the best way to go. Um, also, uh, biological control can be a great option here. And if we're, uh, if we're spraying, you know, uh, indiscriminately, uh, we can kill out a lot of the natural predators as well. So if we're, we're spraying a non-selective uh, insecticide, um, we can kill some of those natural predators like uh, lady beetles, our, our ladybugs, lacewings, parasitic wasps are all uh, enemies of the aphid and they will, they will eat them. But if we're spraying too many chemicals, we might kill them out of our, our system. Um, we can encourage those uh, species, those those natural predators to be in our in our gardens um, or even our farm uh, fields. Uh, we can do strips of uh, perennial plants that that would be um, pollen sources for some of these uh, these insects that are, are beneficial. But uh, we really 
we can encourage them to be there. Uh, transplanting them there does not work very well. So, um, you know, we see those, those buckets of ladybugs that you can buy online or in the uh, garden center. And typically those are not gonna stick around in our field very long. So we can uh, encourage uh, those beneficial insects to, to be in, in, our, uh, in our fields, but buying them and kind of transplanting them in, they typically uh, don't stick around very long if you've, if you've released those buckets. It's a fun thing to do with your kids, uh, but they're not going to really be a huge impact on, on any uh, insect pests that are in your yard. And I am going way too slow here. I, we've got a lot of, of stuff to cover. Um, all right. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, that you might encounter with your melon crops are cucumber beetles. So there are, there's two different kinds that we might see. So there's the Western spotted cucumber beetle and the Western striped cucumber beetle. And I think you can probably figure out uh, where they get their names. Uh, they're very similar sizes. Um, it's just this, this spotted and striped patterning uh, that really uh, helps us distinguish between the two. Uh, but they're not, they don't act exactly the same uh, in our gardens. So the, uh, the adults of both species will feed on the stems, the flowers, they'll feed on the immature fruits, uh, really cause a lot of damage. And, and you can actually see, sometimes you'll see uh, on the melons where they've got that kind of brown um, scraping on the rind. Um, sometimes uh, that can be from, from beetle damage to the immature fruit. Um, but uh, the, the striped cucumber beetle has an extra little uh, trick and it likes to, the, the larvae uh, will actually uh, eat the roots of the melon vines as well. So uh, we, it's a pest in two stages of its, of its life cycle. Um, so they're actually uh, attacking the roots a little earlier in the season, and then the adults um, will eat the, the leaves and stems later on. So um, again, cucumber beetle, beetle control, we want to monitor, we want to see that what's happening here. Um, mulch can be a great thing. Uh, drip irrigation is uh, one way that we can help with this. Um, the, the beetles uh, live, live in the soil and they um, like it better when it's a little damp. So if we're uh, not wetting the whole area and if we're just dripping right around the plants that can help uh, slow the, the growth of beetle populations. Uh, again, row covers can be great. Um, and then we can avoid planting things near other susceptible crops. So if this is, this is in like a, a backyard scale um, or, or whether it's even, you know, fields adjacent to each other, um, there are other crops like corn, tomatoes, uh, potatoes and beans that, that also are affected by these beetles. And uh, we could try to use them as a trap crop somewhere else, plant uh, something that they might move to another area. Um, or we can think about, you know, separating ourselves from, uh, from those other crops that might be uh, a source of food for these beetles. Uh, so that, that one you can kind of um, Play it either way and, and see which one might be more effective for you to, to stay away from all the other uh, sources or maybe put uh, other sources of food nearby and try to move the, the beetles over that direction. Um, and then we want to uh, destroy crop residues. So we don't want to leave uh, a lot of vines and, and things left over at the end of winter um, because that will allow those, those uh, eggs to uh, winter over. And we want to just move those out of our of our system. Um, if we're doing chemical control of, of the beetles, uh, because, because there are different life cycles and they attack different um, parts of the plant, we can think about um, sort of timing our, our chemical control. So in the, the spring and the, the summer, I mean in the late summer, we're going to be attacking adults, you know, the ones that have either overwintered or the ones that are newly um, grown into adult stage. Uh, in the early summer, uh, we're going to be trying to target those larvae, uh, especially of the striped uh, cucumber beetle. Um, we want to get them after they hatch, um, but before they move down toward the, uh, the roots and are, are harder for us to get to them. Um, and then biological control, again, uh, we can try to promote uh, healthy soil and, and encourage beneficial insects to be there. Um, some of the natural enemies of the, the cucumber beetle uh, are ground beetles, soldier, soldier beetles, um, and, and nematodes. 
uh, another another pest that you might see. Um, we tend to see this one a little. I've I've seen this one um, more the last year or so. Um, it tends to uh, explode in populations a little bit when it's hotter and drier. Um, and we the the two spotted spider mite. Um, they a lot of times we'll see them be kind of an orange color in in the winter, um, and then they then we get. Uh, Early in the spring, we'll, we'll start to see this yellow green color with the two spots. And as they develop a little later on into the summer, they get a little darker brown and the spots are harder to see. Um, but, but these uh, can create sort of a stippled pattern. It's something, uh, once you've seen it, I, I think it's something that you're, it's really pretty easy to recognize. Uh, this, this pattern on the leaves, um, it, it looks almost lacy um, after they've sort of sucked their, their little, uh, parts out of this and it creates this, this damage. Um, we also will see some leaf, uh, some webbing on usually on the underside of the leaves. And if you look in the sunshine, you can see some of that, uh, that webbing starting to, it, it sparkles just a little bit. Um, that's usually um, the easiest way for me to see it anyway, is, is if I'm, I'm looking toward the sunshine. Um, so they, they do cause a, a certain amount of damage. Um, and the best method of control for, for the spider mites is to really just take care of the plants. Uh, if the plants are healthy, uh, they're not going to be as susceptible to this damage. They're not going to be hurt quite as much, um, especially drought stressed plants. And I know that this is the year when uh, probably most of our plants are drought stressed, um, but, but that's when the damage becomes more, more of a problem is when our plants are already sort of um, having some problems. Now, what we do want to consider here is that uh, really trying to avoid uh, sort of broad spectrum insecticides and miticides. And there are miticides available, um, but they typically do more damage than, than good um, for us because uh, one of the, the biggest predators of the, the two-spotted spider mite are, are other mites. Uh, that will attack that. So if we're spraying, we're killing all of its natural predators as well. And, and so we usually end up with a bigger infestation after we've sprayed. Uh, so typically I would, I would say uh, avoid chemicals if, if at all possible. And one of the things you can do is, you know, just wash the leaves off. It sounds really simple, um, but taking a, you know, a strong stream of water and, and just rinsing those leaves off uh, can can move the, the spider mites away and it kind of disrupts um, sort of their cycles. Um, you don't wanna do this just one time. Uh, it seems to work better if we if kind of um, every couple days for a week maybe um, get out there and, and spray them and and you'll see those, those numbers starting to go down. Um, again, uh, the mites are going to be uh, more active uh, if there is more nitrogen uh, available to those plants. So really thinking about managing our, our nitrogen fertilizer and, and not over fertilizing is gonna help in this case as well. All right, so the sow bugs and pill bugs, um, they're cute, right? You know, these are the little roly poly bugs that we play with. Um, so the sow bugs are, are gonna be this one here. You can see the little um, appendages on, on their back end. And then the, the pill bugs are the ones that roll up uh, like this. Um, but for, for melon growers, they can attack um, our sort of the ripe fruit that's just about ready to, uh, to be picked. So uh, that's when they like it the best. Um, they tend to really like cantaloupes a lot, um, but they will eat, you know, Clearly, you can see them attacking this watermelon here. So the sow bugs and pill bugs, it's, it's sort of fun. They're, they're not really true insects. They are actually crustaceans um, that, that live in the soil. And um, so they will, they will feed on the rinds and the outsides of those melons. Um, all right, so control of them. Um, you know, crustaceans we think of as being kind of ocean-dwelling creatures. And the, the pill bugs actually like a fair amount of moisture as well. So they like soil that is fairly wet. And if we can keep our soil a little drier, um, so whether that's with uh, drip irrigation um, or you know, not, um, not mulching so heavily with, with organic mulches that really hold that water in. Um, if we've got a lot of uh, plant debris, you know, leaves and, 
you know, sometimes wood chips, things like that will, will hold water and make our, our soil moist, uh, which a lot of times we think is a great thing, especially uh, in a drought year like this or, or in Utah in general, where we're, we're trying to preserve a moisture. But if we can keep it a little drier, um, that will, will keep those bugs away. Uh, we can also do something like um, putting uh, plastic mulch or landscape fabric and letting those fruits uh, rest on that so that the, where there's kind of a barrier between the soil and the fruits and that will keep them um, from, from getting attacked quite as much. All right, thrips. Um, okay, thrips are a thrips is a fun word. So it is both singular and plural. There's one thrips and there are many, many thrips. Um, and um, these are highly, highly magnified. They are very, very tiny insects. Um, and they do a certain amount of damage. Um, these are maybe not the, the most um, damaging insects to melon crops, but, um, but if we get enough of them in the field, then they can, do, can become really a problem for us. So um, they start to do some stippling on the leaves and they can cause stunted flowers and fruit and then some scarring to the mature fruit as they, you know, they, they suck and, and bite onto the, the plants. Um, melon, uh, a lot of thrips are really attracted to flowers, but melon thrips in particular really, really do like the leaves and the immature fruit. So uh, that is something slightly different about uh, the melon thrips uh, specifically, is that they're, they are attracted to those leaves, which can be, um, sort of a problem in, in some of the ways that we um, that we deal with them. Uh, one of the, the things that people recommend is to uh, making making sure that we don't have any weeds that go to flower because flowers do attract uh, thrips to your field. Um, uh, like I said, melon, uh, melon thrips do have a certain amount of attraction just to those leaves. Um, so that one yes, definitely keep the weeds out of your, um, your fields and try to not let them flower anyway because we don't want those seeds um, left in our yards. Um, but uh, that one is not going to maybe solve everything. Um, so that you'll notice that the thrips, um, they can leave this sort of silvering look to the leaves. Um, they're very, very tiny bites. And then they can also, it can turn into sort of a bronze look. Um, this is very similar to spider mite damage. A lot of this bronzing looks uh, very similar. So the, the real thing, there are uh, pesticides that, that can be used uh, to control thrips, but make sure that you really do have uh, thrips damage and it's not spider mites that you're, you're sort of mistaking. And you can see this uh, sort of these little black uh, specks here. The, the, the frass is one of the ways that we can tell it is uh, thrips that are doing that damage. All right, um, okay. One of the last things uh, that I wanted to talk about uh, tonight was nematodes. Now, we mentioned earlier that the nematodes can be uh, a beneficial insect that attack the, the cucumber beetles. Um, but uh, in this case, this is one that I have seen a few times. This is not one that, that happens a lot. And this is one of those times when I, I'm usually calling for help to, to figure out what exactly is going on. Um, but I uh, have seen a few fields that have had been in melon production for a very long time that have started to show damage from root knot nematodes. So you can tell here by this, this photo, this is again, highly, highly magnified. These are um, little round worms that are not, uh, not really something that we would see with the naked eye. Um, they can infect the plant roots and you'll start to get these, these weird little nodules, the, the knots um, that, that are kind of the, their namesake. And uh, when, when they start to attack you, um, the fields that I've seen the, this in, it just led to kind of reduced yields. The plants were not healthy. Um, something was not right, but we couldn't figure out exactly what was going on. And then when we, when we dug them up and started looking at the roots, we, we, we saw uh, this kind of damage here. Um, and um, there are, are a few things that we can do to control. There, there's soil fumigation that does work. Um, for a backyard, this is probably not the best option and, and probably not something that you might 
really see in a backyard um, situation. Soil fumigation can work, but it's not something that we do in Utah very often. And so it's hard to sometimes find, you know, the equipment or so something to rent to, to get this done. Um, one of the other things that we can do is, is uh, culturally, we can do some crop rotation. Um, and I think this was uh, one of the recommendations that I got when, when um, the person in, in my county was having this problem. Um, we can move on to something else for a few years and the numbers of the nematodes will, will die down to a level where you can plant melons again and, and they won't be uh, really affecting your yields. However, um, in, in our instance, um, corn was, was what we were trying to use as a, um, a crop, a rotation crop, but it's not gonna work for everybody in every situation. This is one where you would definitely want to uh, get this sent to a lab and really ID what's going on for sure, because a lot of these nematodes really have a very wide range of things that they like to eat. And so, uh, you know, there, it, it's very likely that you could plant a, a crop in rotation and it would uh, still have the same problems. So we wanted to make sure that we know that it's something that, that those particular nematodes won't, won't like um, and so that we can uh, remove their, their numbers slowly. Um, they are, they're hard to remove from the soil, um, but they also don't move around in the soil very much. So sanitation is, is important here. We don't wanna spread them around. So if you've got a spot that you know might have uh, those nematodes that are affecting your, your crop, it's, it's somewhere that you would want to um, make sure that you're not driving your tractor through it and then going somewhere else and, and spreading. 